Hi, everyone. We hope that you're taking care of yourself during this challenging time. We decided to do twice weekly online video hangouts that are open to anybody, whether you're a patron or not. Every Tuesday and Thursday from 10 a.m. Pacific, that's 1 p.m. Eastern, up until 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, where it's just open. You can come hang out, have some friends while you do some work or find people to chat with or play games with. So if you want more information about that, if you want to find out when the next hangout is happening, go Go to multiamory.com slash hangout. You're listening to A Pleasure Podcast, a podcast network revolutionizing the conversation around sex and relationships. For more, visit pleasurepodcasts.com. Acting jealous and doing the jealous things is not a way to love your partner. It's not a way to show them love. Jealous. Yeah. (laughs) Don't do the the jealous. Don't do the jealous. Don't you do that jealous. You can, you can quote us on that. Welcome to the Multi Amory Podcast. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. We believe in looking to the future of relationships, not maintaining the status quo of the past. So whether you're monogamous, polyamorous, swinging, casually dating, or if you just do relationships differently, we see you and we're here for you. On this episode of the Multi Amory Podcast, we're going to be talking about some of the worst relationship and dating advice ever. What we're actually doing is we're talking about some of this kind of mainstream, old, antiquated relationship advice, as well as some research and statistics about that, because many of us got our relationship advice from our parents or other <laughs> probably unqualified sources when we were growing up, like our peers. Uh, And while some relationship advice has changed drastically, a lot of it's still the same crap that it's been for decades, if not longer. So today, we're going to be talking about some of the ways that dating has changed, the way that the advice needs to change to go with that, as well as some stits and stats, which we always love to cover uh, in some recent relationship research from experts in the field. I do love that it feels like we've come full circle. Our very, 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 very first episode of Multi-Amory was a debunking, it wasn't relationship advice, but it was debunking like polyamory myths. And now I feel like we're back on the debunking train. Yeah, we did it in uh, your best friend's random like kitchen or it wasn't the kitchen it was it was in the dining room on that like glass table (laughs) it was so and now here we are again it was so bad it was so echoey crowded around one microphone yeah Uh (laughs) uh-huh writing all our notes on a piece of paper and just sharing that around the dog was running in and out (laughs) (laughs) and what's changed since then very little surprisingly well i mean there are cats and dogs barking and yes Right. And we're all in different cities right now, recording it with technology and interactive Google Docs that we edit on the fly while we're recording. And I think a lot's changed. Yeah. No, people, and so. people actually listen to us now. That's that, true. that has changed as well. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Uh, okay, gang. So I have to give the disclaimer. Our goal in this episode is not to piss all over more traditional ideas of love and family or marriage or traditional relationships or things like that. But rather, we think it's important to show how the goals of relationships have changed over time and our approaches to relationships have changed over time, maybe arguably for the better. Um, And also talk about how, you know, the old advice that many of us were given, that many of us grown up with, many of us were socialized with, is not necessarily the best advice for modern relationships. And again, most romantic advice that was probably written mm, pre-2012, I'm going to say. Jane uh, Austen era. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just saying anything that was written pre-2012 was primarily written for heteronormative couples. Mm-hmm. So bear that in mind as we go through this. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, when I was kind of researching and looking up this episode, it it sort of prompted me to think about myself growing up because I kind of grew up in a fairly non-traditional setting, which was, you know, my mom and dad in an affair. Uh, He was married and she was not like I've never grown up knowing my mom being married, although she was married a long, long time before I ever came into the picture. But I guess I was curious to ask the two of you 
when you were growing up, did you feel like, you know, was it a dream of yours or were you hoping that eventually like you'd get married and have kids and have like a quote unquote normal relationship when you were growing up? And what did that sort of look like to you? Um, When did you think you were going to get married, et cetera? So I definitely grew up with that kind of normative idea that, you know, essentially not like the goal of my life, I would say, but just one of those things that's definitely a goal and that I was definitely going to have was to be married and to have kids, was to be a father, Um, that that was very much, I don't know, I guess something that I put a lot of value into um, hmm. and it, and it is still actually something that I, I value a lot. Like I value parents a lot. I think parents are, are amazing and doing something incredibly difficult. And especially in this country, doing it without a lot of support. Uh, I still think that's amazing, but my mind has changed about whether I'm going to be one of those. Um, but yeah, no, it's definitely, definitely had a pretty, pretty heteronormative, you know, a motto normative of view of what my life would look like. What about you, yeah. Dedeker? Yeah, well, I was raised in the church, so definitely oh, yeah. extremely mm-hmm. heteronormative, extremely mononormative. Um, yeah, I don't know. When I was young, I didn't really terribly have a ton of ambition for my life uh, outside of, I mean, like I had certain like little dreams that I'd have here and there and, and things that I wanted to do, but I do know that like the church kind of set me up to really feel like getting married is the accomplishment yeah, having I think that's a traditional a relationship. Yeah, yeah, that's the accomplishment. That's the thing to look forward to, you know, and maybe you'll have a career. Maybe you won't. Like, you know, I think I was very much told that you'll be equally satisfied whether you're pursuing a career or whether you're just a stay at home mom. And so as long as you find a good man who like makes money and is good to you and is a man of God, also very important, right. then you'll be OK not having a career. I really believe that. Like, I, I truly, truly did. Like, it's The truth nuts. is, Zedeker, you will never be satisfied. It's true. I'm not even <laughs> satisfied with a career. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah. That was the Hamilton um, reference for all of you out there, but yes. And, and honestly, I think to me, as far as your question of when I thought that I might get married or might have this normal relationship, um, I was also raised in purity culture you know, evangelical purity culture, which very much encouraged complete abstinence before marriage um, and also even encouraged no dating before marriage, which is nuts. Um, yeah. You, I guess dating you know, goodbye also too. Encouraged, yeah. Exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah. Also oh, encouraged, boy. you know, things like more like biblical courtship became a hot buzzword back then. And it's this kind idea of the hot of, thing now too, again, right? Well, <laughs> in the time of d- digital courtship. Oh, wait, yeah. In the time of cro- digital courtship in the time of yeah. coronavirus. Correct. Yes. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've come full circle once again. Um, right. No, but like literally you're not going to even date anyone or get into any kind of relationship any with anyone until you're like ready to get married, which is just I can't so... even ima- How does that work? Like okay, that's so, that's so that's fascinating very, to me. That's a very circuitous way of me saying I was pretty sure I was going to get married like as soon as I could after 18 because wow. that's that what did a lot not of happen. Even, that's what a lot of evangelical kids do because you're just kind of taught like your whole purpose in this is like if you're going to date someone, you better be ready to marry them. And then you get so horny not being able to have sex and you think like, well, clearly it must be ordained. We're doing everything right. We're doing the whole biblical courtship thing and not having sex. And we've been told that if we don't have sex and wait until marriage, then our, God's going to bless our relationship. Yeah, then we'll And be so happy. trust me, yeah. I know a billion friends from my childhood who got married at 20, 21, 19, mm-hmm. and then they all become my clients. <laughs> to be totally honest. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. No, I, um, yeah. I, as far as when, yeah, I definitely assumed I guess during college and was always like, even well, you from, were engaged in college, right? I or got just in, afterwards. I got engaged right. Like the summer that I graduated. Yeah. Um, got engaged and didn't end up getting married. And looking back, I'm like, you know, I was 23 when I got engaged looking back, I'm like, that's too young for anyone to know who they are and what they would want for that. Oh, long. Yeah. But to me, that was like very much a normal age to do it the fact that I hadn't married someone that I dated in high school, I was like already maybe behind the times possibly. So yeah, it's just that like, if you don't have anyone to give you that perspective, especially when all of our 
protagonists and like historical figures and characters in books and everyone's getting married then and is portrayed as if they could really know what their life's goal or mission is at that age too. Uh, you have no frame of reference. You're like, yeah, of course. Yeah, I guess I when I was growing up, I did have a, a long term high school sweetheart, but he was pretty abusive ultimately. And so that did not work out. But there was a point in my life where I thought that I would marry him and that that would just be the thing, even though, uh, yeah, I that did not happen at all. And I think it, even though also I, I was not religious at all growing up, I still had a lot of those same like values and still like not to have sex before marriage to a degree or at least that like you're bad if you do kind of thing and that yeah probably you'll get married and have kids and that that is sort of checking a box or like the thing that people strive to do in their lives and even though I did not grow up evangelical that still was very much a thing in my life too so yeah yeah that it's, that it's not really I think a lot of people blame it on Christianity or religion, mm. but I think it's, it's so much more a part of our culture than that. And I think Emily, actually, you've been someone in my life who's really shown that to me, um, in, in everything, you know, with the struggles that we've had with our families when coming out as polyamorous or non-monogamous or, or other mm -hmm. things that you've told me about, you know, growing up completely atheist was just sort of like, yeah, this isn't, this isn't actually as different as you would think. Right. It's not like, yeah, oh, wow, exactly. she doesn't have all the baggage that I have. It's like, no, we still had it just like in different words. Right. Yeah. I don't have like the biblical baggage, but I do have a lot of other baggage that comes with just like growing up in our society in general. Yeah. Which, yeah, I think is some of what we're going to talk about today. So along those lines, um, let's talk about this very interesting match.com study. Can you take it away, Jess? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so first of all, we're going to preface this by saying this is a study that was done by match.com back in like 2015, 2016. Well, 2016 is yeah. the article that we got a lot of this from, but if the study was actually going on before that, I think. Anyway, yeah, around that I time, right? So, like yeah. middle of the, the tens. And uh, so match.com pretty traditional dating site, very heteronormative, very much focused on finding the one, finding people who are looking for a long lasting relationship. Like that's who they market to. That's kind of what their whole thing is. And they did a study with 2000 of their users who asked questions like in your relationship, when did you become Facebook official quote, or when did you meet your first partner or things like that? And we just wanted to share some of the findings from that. And then we're going to discuss them. So the first one here is that, I hate the wording of this, but the average woman, yeah, the, <laughs> the average woman, <laughs> whoever that might be, the yeah. average woman finds her life partner at the age of 25, while for men, so young still, it is very young, while for men, they're more likely to find their soulmate at 28, Okay, with half of people finding, quote, the one in their 20s. Okay, yes. Now, we can agree that this is a little bit nausea-inducing. However, <laughs> when I was 25, in the relationship that I was in at 25, I was pretty convinced. Yep. This is oh, my yeah. life partner. 100%. And I want this person to be my life partner. Like, So, of course, if you'd asked me, yeah. especially if I'd, I'd gone on to marry that person, if you'd asked me, I'd be like, yeah, I was 25. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. My soulmate. Oh, yeah. I, I guess. One. Yeah. I guess when mm -hmm. I was 25, I was with you, Jess. Aha. I win. <laughs> 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 I got you right in the right window there. <laughs> now that's uh, interesting because ironically maybe you are soulmates because even though there's no romantic relationship mm. it's like he still entangled you in this whole business partner scheme <laughs> right. this whole that's business really partner point. podcast co-host scheme right so funny yeah, yeah I, I mean yeah that is that is fascinating but i you kind of it were with me in a very big like changing point in my life i think for a lot of things including a lot of these ideals right so yeah. What were some other things that this study found? Yeah, so next one, and we'll, we'll talk about these more later, but so the next one here is that um, most people waited five months to say, I love you for the first time, which to me, that seems slow. I feel like every one of my relationships, it's been I know. well I was before like, oh, five months. Really so that was interesting. Oh, I think my my personal average is usually about four months. Mm, I think mine's usually three. Mine's like a month. 
Okay. Well, maybe not. So, maybe no. I mean, I think the most recent the relationship that I've been now that was a month, but I think before that it was it was definitely longer. Uh, I hold out. I yeah. do. You? I put yes. I put kind of some strict standards on myself that like before oh, I can say right. I love you to someone, I need to see them have a bad moment. Mm. and see how they deal with it before i feel comfortable declaring my love wish i had done that with our ex-mutual partner dedeker well yeah well, here we well. are here we are well, okay. that'll happen after the fact. okay uh and then as far as updating their relationship status on facebook uh was also five months and then six months until they were given their own drawer at their partner's home so it's interesting oh, how I, it, it seems like the I love you and Facebook official comes very shortly before that own drawer. Yeah, that's funny that the drawer is now a, a milestone. It's on the relationship escalator, y'all. Now, right. Maybe we should add that to the relationship escalator when we're <laughs> yeah. talking about it. Aww. Yeah. When, it's yeah. funny. The drawer, th- the, drawer. the drawer thing's funny, though, because, I mean, for me, it's different now because I don't really have a permanent place of my own. But when uh. I did... For me, I was like, you've come over, you know, more than three times. Like, here, I'm going to make a space for you to leave stuff if you want to. And not everyone takes me up on it. six months. But I was just sort of like, yeah, sure, why not? Like, what? But how much? Okay, if someone's only come over to your house three times, how much? Do you give them a whole drawer? How much space do you give them? Um, I, guess, I don't know. I guess it depended. I ha- also had a lot of, of closet space in that place. Yeah, I don't, so have, that, I don't like, have that much space. Here's some, you know, here's some, here's a space for you to keep like a change of clothes or two so that if you spontaneously spend the night, you have stuff here, right? That was more the idea. Maybe really that's cool a good, place. maybe that's a good benchmark for all our polysaturated folks out there of if you're running out of drawer space. <laughs> That's a signal. You gotta <laughs> slow down. Yeah. You gotta slow huh. down. Yeah. Maybe you're bad at evaluating your own emotional capacity, but let your drawers do the talking. Mm, I like that. That's gonna be I the t shirt. Yeah. Let your drawers do the talking. And yeah. it's it makes sense on multiple levels. Okay, it does. I'm gonna go it does. on. Yeah. All right. So thirty four percent of respondents in this study said that they would wait a week or two before holding hands with someone. Okay, I get that. Thirty one percent saying that they would kiss their date immediately if things were going well. I'm assuming that's on a first date. Right. So it takes to th- longer to hold hands than it does to kiss. Like that's more intimate somehow. Well, yeah, but we've kind of been set up culturally to think that like the first kiss is the gateway to all Everything. other intimacy. Yeah. Uh, okay. I think we need to be careful about reading this statistic here, though, because I think these might be part of the same question where it's like kind of how fast are you willing to move and that 31% said they would kiss on the first date essentially. And 34 said they'd wait a week or two before holding hands. I think these are kind of like the two extremes on the spectrum. Mm. Okay. My guess would be that these aren't the same 30% saying I would kiss immediately, but definitely wouldn't hold their hand for two weeks. (laughs) I don't know. In my personal experience, again, like I'm saying, because we've really been set up by culture and media and movies and stuff like that, where it's like, the kiss is the thing that then opens up all the other intimacy, you know? Cause think about it. It's like in your favorite rom-coms, you don't see our characters like holding hands first or like cuddling first That's true. before they kiss. It's like, we've been set up so that the kiss is the turning point. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, it totally makes sense that yeah, I would kiss right. someone first, but I wouldn't go for their hand on a first date. And honestly, times that people on first dates have gone for my hand on a first date. You're like, whoa. My, yes. My initial intimate. reaction has been like, whoa, uh, we haven't kissed yet. So I mean, we're going to kiss. Oh, what does this mean? I don't know. And then uh, my hand is like it's dripping with sweat and it's awful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. Okay. I'm going to keep moving along. So yeah. I don't want to talk about that anymore. So 27% <laughs> said that they would wait between one or two weeks to sleep with their partner for the first time, and twenty three percent said that they would wait up to a month. Okay, that seems like a long time to me. I don't know about the two of you. Like, yeah, I mean, maybe a week, depending. I, I I'm not going to do that with just anyone, but yeah, I generally like in the past if I really do like someone and want to see them again multiple times, then uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can there. think of someone that I dated not too long ago where I think it did probably take us a month or so to kiss, but that was on our second date. It, we just didn't schedule very well. <laughs> this right, is now, sleep with your yeah. partner, though. Oh, this was sleep with? Oh, I thought this was we're still on kissing. 
No, no, no we've moved on, oh, Jace. Boy, well, we never slept You're together, so infinity time. That's, oh, that's... oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> infinity time what <laughs> yeah. about you Dedeker? do you think that this that a month is a long time because you know what when i was kind of in uh, like the pendulum swing the opposite direction from purity culture and when i was realizing like oh all this is toxic like this is ridiculous like why do we punish women's sexuality and like guilt people into not sleeping on a first date and stuff like that um you know i would have been like a month like that's way too long what are people thinking that's ridiculous and honestly now especially in the past few years, like my dating approach has slowed down so much that I honestly, I may as well be Jane Austen at this point where I'm just like, yeah, we're just going to sit and I'm going to stitch on my sampler. We're going to talk about the weather. <laughs> and especially right now where it's like, I'm probably not going to physically see you for another eight right. months or whatever. <laughs> I'm like, oh, let's boy. just oh, boy. really take it slow. Walk through the countryside, enjoy the heath you know, write some poetry, <laughs> What's cook, a some, cook some chicken pot pie. That's kind of my approach these days. Mm, okay. What's yeah, I, I don't heath? know what a heath is either. What's a heath? A heath, it's very Jane Austenian. Uh, it is an area of open, uncultivated land, especially in Britain, with characteristic vegetation of heather, gorse, and coarse grasses. So, you know, literally every single film that you've seen, that's a film adaptation of Emma or whatever and, the heck. Pride and Prejudice, yeah, where Pride and Prejudice. Kira Knightley take... is running through the fields. Yeah, they're always taking strolls through the heath and stuff That's like that. That's the heath, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. I love it. That's amazing. All right, so the first argument normally takes place around the six-month mark. So six months, that, that's a lot of different things. You got your uh, your drawer space. You got your <laughs> I love yous. Yeah, you and just you got, got added ang- on Facebook. Yeah, and, and then, then you, you also get... An argument, exactly. That's um, all, but six months, that's also kind of the early end of the range of when NRE chemicals start wearing off. Yeah. That's true. Maybe Makes that's sense. why. Mm-hmm. And also around six months, people tend to introduce partners to their parents for the first time. Hmm. So Yeah, it's, it's a real make it or break it kind of time. Yeah, 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 I guess so. And then finally, oh, here's this one. 33% of people will have their first conversation about the future within one year and engagements typically happen after two years, and then weddings take place after three, and kids after four. Just boom, boom, boom. Just really, one all year those after dominoes. another. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, boom, yeah. boom, boom. So I was interested to see kind of what these statistics tell us, what this mm. like study tells people out there in the world at large. Like, did you two get any particular feelings from hearing these studies? Well, something that I want to point out is just reminding people that this was from 2015, 2016, Mm -hmm. you know, this isn't old. Yeah, this is pre-Trump. This isn't old. This isn't well, but this is not from like the 90s or anything like that. It's like clearly our idea of traditional relationships of finding the one of finding soulmates and stuff like that is still going strong. And people riding up that escalator, like still going strong, which is, again, to remind people, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But it is kind of funny to think about how um, I know the three of us live in this little bubble where everyone's in weird, non-traditional, revolutionary relationships. um, And yet traditional relationships are still taking the cake in many regards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The thing that we've talked about before way back when on this show and comes up every now and then is this idea of how do you measure success of a relationship? And it's a really challenging thing to determine, especially, especially if you're just having one half of a relationship, fill out a questionnaire, giving you some information as opposed to someone like the Gottman Institute who does these much more longitudinal studies. We'll talk about, we'll talk about a little later. Yeah. Um, But, you know, who will like really bring a couple in and observe the way they interact with each other rather than just what they say they do when they're with each other. So with a lot of this stuff like that, like this very first one we talked about of, you know, the average woman finds her life partner at the age of 25 and men find their soulmate at 28. What I want to know is how old were they when you asked them this question? And Hmm. if you asked them again, 10, 20 years later, do they still think that Would was they be the divorced? age? Right? Exactly. Which we're <laughs> yeah, also... when they're on their second marriage, are they going to exactly. say the same thing? <laughs> exactly. Right. Uh, and I would bet you that most people would not. 
<laughs> or at least half mm. of people would not. And I think that would change these statistics significantly if you were to ask people these questions later in life. Now, to be fair, we are finding that because people are marrying later, that is lowering the divorce rate for our generation, for mm -hmm. millennials. Because I know we look at 25, 28, and we're like, gosh, that's young. But like the generation before us, it was like 23, 25, yeah. you know, and, you know, researchers think that that would make sense. Like if you're getting married even that young, combined with kind of the sexual revolution and feminism and shifts in how our culture operates, that then that it would make sense that by the time you're on marriage number three, you're like, no, that definitely wasn't my life partner or my soulmate. <laughs> Maybe it'll be different for our generation. Yeah, I, I mean, I hope so. Because I still think that like the prevalent theme out there is that like youth and being young and desirable are all linked. And I mean, I even had this real asshole of a partner once upon a time tell me that like, yeah, he believes that women's like kind of worth went down as they aged just because they offer less to men and they're less desirable the older you that they get. The entire patriarchy? <laughs> Possibly, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I I was like his name was Patriarchy. 20, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was like, it, it, I dated this person from like 19 to 21, like on and off. And it was clearly, yeah, hope, hope you're doing well, Mr. Out there. But it Mr. was Patriarchy <laughs> Mr. Patriarchy. But yeah, I remember being struck by that even at the time, even though for whatever reason, I continued to date him. But yeah, that uh, it, it, thinking about that, about like how, well, you know, once you hit 30 or whatever, you're totally all used up and stuff. And if you haven't found your soulmate by then, then nobody's going to want to be with you. And I just turned 32, and I do not uh, agree with that in any sense. You know, even if I were single, I don't think that I couldn't find somebody to love me out there. But I do think that a lot of people feel that way and that it is very challenging for them to not be with someone uh, when they're in their 30s or 40s or 50s. Yeah, I and mean, have we told you about the the Christmas cake thing in Japan. You've told me about Christmas cakes. Well, Christmas cake is a thing in Japan. Not yeah. quite like fruit cakes like we have around Christmas time. It's just like a Christmassy themed cake. But yeah, there's a saying in Japan uh, that, you know, a woman past the age of 25 is kind of like a Christmas cake after December 25th in that no one wants it anymore. Oh, okay. Um, yes. which wow. Is, yeah. Is, wow, oh, Japan. Okay. I will say from what I've seen, I mean, things are changing in Japan also as That's far good. as people getting married later and women getting married later and, and things like that. But uh, but yeah, that's still very much a thing. That's still there's mm -hmm. still those those holdovers still clinging on to us, I feel. Well, and kids and stuff, especially, too, which I get into a little bit more later on in this episode. But yeah, just the fact that uh, that we are so told so much by everybody that like you will use up your ability to have a kid the older that you get. And if you're going to do it, then you need to do it when you're young and vital and it just gets harder and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So all of those things, it's, it's a tough pill to swallow, I think, for many people. Okay, so those were all statistics that from... What I'm guessing, it sounds like these are people self-reporting. Yeah. Are y'all mm -hmm. getting that same sense? Yeah. yeah um, you know, match.com. Well, that's how they did it. It was, it, it was a questionnaire. Yeah. That's, that's not even just hearsay. That, it was a questionnaire that was sent to their users. So, yes. Right. They're not going around shoving microphones in people's faces on their first date. <laughs> when did you get your soulmate? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, we're going to look on the opposite side of the research that the Gottman Institute has done. Um not based on self-reporting, but literally based on observation. You know, we've talked about the Gottman Institute before. They do really, really rigorous research on relationships, you know, like even to the point of literally having couples live in a studio apartment that they have rigged up with a bunch of cameras and microphones and wow. taking their blood, taking their urine, like at every couple of hours and stuff yeah. like that, like coding it's... their facial expressions, like <sighs> writing down literally everything they say to each other to like really, really codify and research what is going on with these couples? Yeah, what does like blood their, and urine have to do with that? Their hormone They're levels. They're looking at like cortisol stuff. levels. Yeah. Hormone oh, levels. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They go really, really thorough with this stuff. They also do a lot of recording people in therapy and codifying facial expressions and heart rate and breath rate and oxygen levels and like all kinds of stuff. So yeah, it's they, get, cool. they get all sciencey, sciencey with relationships. So, but specifically, we're talking about their research on 
when and why relationships fail, because I think we also have a lot of questionable relationship advice and platitudes out there about why relationships might fail or might fall apart. Um, But based on their research, they found that the average couple wait six years before they will seek help for marital problems. Um, I'm assuming meaning they've had problems for six years before seeking help. Or is that Most just six likely. years from getting married? Now I'm not sure which, which one that it, is. It, this was literally what it said. So I'm assuming from getting married. Okay. Got I don't it. know. Yeah. So they're coming That's up good. on the seven-year itch. Ask the Gottmans. They're coming up there on the seven-year itch and right. they're like, okay, let's do some therapy now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they find that 67% of couples experience a precipitous drop in marriage satisfaction in the first three years of a child's life. That makes sense. There's a lot of Mm. factors that contribute to that. You know, of course, one of them being that it's becoming increasingly harder and harder to raise children, especially in America with very little social support. Um, And the first three years is hard. That's when your child needs the most care. They do find that marital satisfaction dips in the first three years, stays pretty low, and then starts to gradually climb up again as soon as they get the, the heck out of the house yeah basically <laughs> basically as soon <laughs> so, as like, the youngest child turns 18 then marriage satisfaction starts creeping back in um they also found in their research that stable relationships have a one to five negative to positive interaction ratio and i'm going to clarify that a little bit it's one to five during conflict so as in healthy relationships when the people are having an argument or in some kind of conflict they have five positive interactions for every single negative interaction that they have. Um, To extrapolate this out to periods where they're not in conflict, it's actually one to 20. So stable relations. Yes. Yes. Wow. So 20 20 positive interactions to one negative one. one. Yes. Outside of conflict. Yes. Yep. Wow. Uh, Yeah. And by contrast, unstable relationships have a 0.8 to one positive to negative interactions. So, so it's like a, a slightly positive <laughs> interaction. In, no, just for like, every negative interaction, they have 80% of a positive interaction. Right, even worse than that, Em. Yeah, that they're not even having a <laughs> one full positive interaction in between each negative Exactly. One. Wow. There you go. Uh, wow. Now, this is something we have talked about in past relationships, that this ratio is really important because even if you have a 50-50 ratio of like... Yeah, half the time it feels good and half the time it's really bad. It's like, no, that's just bad. You know, I know that often when you're stuck in a bad relationship or in some kind of toxic communication dynamic with a partner that you really want to look at the good side. And it's like, well, half the time or even two thirds of the time they're good to me. And then a third of the time is really, really crappy. And it's like, no, that's still not good. That's still not a stable relationship. Yeah. 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 I also did uh, just look this up about that six years thing. It's six years of being unhappy before. Okay. Seeking it help. is that. So six years of that's being a unhappy, long time. right? So that's not even just six years from getting married. So we're well, well into this thing and suffering a lot before finally getting some help. Well, I would like to hope that that's changing. I would like to hope that as we continue to destigmatize getting therapy and getting counseling, that that that's changing. That people are not waiting quite so long. Yeah, being so is the counselor. They get help. So yeah. is the counselor. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then another one of the Gottman Institute's findings is that half of all marriages end in the first seven years. So that probably goes along with the waiting to seek help for marital problems. Yeah, that half of all marriages. That's a lot. That's, right. yeah. You're yeah, not so, even waiting that long. So to then go back to the Match.com thing, where they're saying 25 and 28 is when they meet the one or the soulmate or whatever. Yeah, by the, the time you're partner. my age. Eh. Right, exactly. It's, it's like by over. the time you're in your mid-30s even, you might yeah. have a different answer to that question. Unless you really have internalized this idea that there is just one person for you. And then I think a lot of people could end up feeling like, well, I had my chance and I messed it up and now Mm. I'll never find it again, which is, I think, really shitty that we teach people that, you know, yeah, absolutely, that that we could give people that idea about it. it really sucks. Yeah. 
Um, finally, there was additional research that I looked up that said that the average age for a couple going through their first divorce is 30 years old and that 60 percent of the divorces include or sorry, involve spouses who are between the ages of 25 and 39. So that's, that's yeah, that's probably that yeah, someone going through their first divorce. Right. will do it between the ages of 25 and 39. So, OK, what do all these statistics tell us? <laughs> <laughs> that all of the stuff beforehand was bullshit <laughs> i don't know maybe i don't know uh, something something because we've talked about some of these statistics before and something that i always come away from it really kind of be marveling at i guess is on the one hand we're taught this very magical idea of what love and relationships looks like where there's the one that that, you know, that God would find you a mate, perhaps, or just that like fate would, or that you're meant to be together. There's a lot of you complete me, right? There's a lot of stuff we say to each other or that we're taught to think that's very magical about how wonderful it all is, right? And yet, at the same time, I feel like most of us get raised with these very, very low standards for how good a relationship not only can be, but should be that in order for it to last, it has to be this good with the 20 to one thing, right? Of like, you need to be having, like you should, you deserve to, and it's actually possible to find a relationship where you're having 20 positive interactions to one negative one, not just during that first year, but long term. And that even when you're fighting, still having more positive than negative interactions, even during that. And that for me is the thing that I, I never... I was never raised to think that that was a standard you could have, that that would be reasonable, mm. that, you know, it's like you have this fairy tale idea where you never fight. And then you have the reality and all the sitcoms of you're fighting all the time. And it's like the, the truth is somewhere in the middle here and we don't get that. So there's this weird, I don't know, this weird dichotomy of like, we're taught this magical idea, but then also not taught that it's possible to have an actually happy, stable relationship. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think looking at these statistics, it just makes me think that it's really important to internalize, just get help sooner rather than later. Um, I know I definitely feel that way about people who are first tackling non-traditional relationships or opening up their relationship or something like that. It's like get support sooner than you think that you do. And that support doesn't have to be intensive therapy or intensive couples counseling or whatever. It can be reading a book. It can be listening to a podcast like ours. It can be joining a community where you're able to get support or, or things like that. But yeah, I think that like with relationships in general, whether it's monogamous or non-monogamous, it's like get some kind of help and support sooner than you think that you do. Like don't wait six years of being unhappy before, before finally getting help. Yeah. yeah. The and again, I hope that those things are changing now that we are kind of moving into a time period of different relationship styles coming out and being prevalent and being heard and being thought of as being okay. And yeah, that hopefully those things will change. Yeah, exactly. It's just, it's so much easier to fix something that's, that's difficult when you do it right away. Right. It's like if someone does something that bothers you and you talk about it right away, that's much easier to resolve than six years of learning to resent them and hate them for it. And then even if they're trying to fix it, you, you won't receive it because you, you've just so entrenched yourself in hating them for it or being angry at them or resenting them for it. So we're going to go on to talk about some very commonplace relationship advice that exists out there and why it's terrible. <laughs> but before we get to that, we're going to take a quick break to talk about some of our sponsors and ways that you can help keep these resources available for everybody for free as a podcast by going to our sponsors and supporting us on Patreon. So our beloved adamandeve.com is this week's sponsor. Um, and we really love them just simply because they have been with us since the beginning of Multiamory. Uh, and that's awesome. We love like brand relationships. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. But we just love them. They're awesome. Uh, and if you are in a relationship, you might be having sex. And so you might need some sexy things. 
And because of that, why don't you go to Adam and Eve and grab some sexy things? I like sexy how you're walking people like... through the whole like logical process of <laughs> exactly. Of... No, just in case, you know what? I'm going to spell it all out for you. Uh, <laughs> so you might want to get some sexy clothing, some like lingerie, get a little sexy candle, sexy <laughs> toy, and maybe some sexy porn. You can get all of these things, even condoms, at AdamandEve.com. So if you were looking for something that maybe is a little expensive, a little out of your price range, you can use our promo code MULTI, M-U-L-T-I, at checkout. You can actually use it as many times as you want. Get a bunch of really expensive things and knock 50% right off of that. Um, You'll also get a free gift and free shipping when you use our promo code. So definitely go and do that. Go to adamandeve.com. Use multi, and then it'll also give us a nice little kickback, and we will love you even more than we already do, and Adam and Eve for that matter. Since the beginning of this show, it's been really important to us to make these resources and this information available to as many people as possible. And doing that through a free podcast has been amazing in helping us reach more people to let them know that they are represented, that there are people who understand you and who are working on relationship advice and tools for you and not just if you fit into this one particular mold that's in the movies and the TV shows. And over the last five years, we've been able to grow that reach to so many more people. It's been really amazing. And that's been almost entirely possible just because of people supporting us at patreon.com slash multiamory. Something that's been really beautiful to see is that also in our Patreon community, you know, some of our listeners are able to, for the first time ever, access a supportive community and a support network. You know, we have a lot of listeners who are in remote areas who don't necessarily have access to a supportive community. And our Patreon community has been able to give that to a lot of people, which is really wonderful to see. And so we really appreciate the people who are in our community who choose to support the show. And we want to give back to the people who are going out of their way to help us keep making this show. So some of the cool things that we offer as a thank you include private Facebook and Discord communities just for our Patreon listeners, having early releases on episodes, getting bonus episodes, and also private video discussion groups. We love getting to give back to our community in that way. So if you do want to join this amazing community of people who help make this show possible, go to patreon.com slash multiamory today and become a patron of ours. We'd really appreciate it. All right, so we've gotten the stits and stats, we've gotten the science, we've gotten the questionnaires, we've gotten the research. Let's we've got talk the about... tools, we've got the yes. talent. Okay. Yes, we can rebuild him. Uh, let's talk <laughs> Who are we about... Talking about? <laughs> we're just mashing together a whole lot of things right okay. now. <laughs> we're just riffing, we're, we're jamming, we're, we're having <laughs> a good time. Jamming and jamming, yeah. Yeah, okay. Let's talk about some of the more let's say, antiquated relationship advice that's out there. And now, I'll be honest, when I first looked through this list, my knee-jerk reaction is to be like, ugh, does anyone still believe this anymore? How awful. Yeah, like, I think some people. No, like, no. But then, literally every single one of this list, I was like, I know someone who still thinks this. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. All right, so some of this list is a mix. Um, some of it's from an article from Best Life uh, that was called 50 Relationship Tips That Are Actually Terrible. And some are from a book from 1995 called The Rules. We're going to talk about that more in our bonus content. So let's start talking about some of these rules and uh, discuss them a little bit. Because like Dedeker said, knowing people who at least one of these still believes, and I think even looking at ourselves, like there might still be remnants of this, even if on the surface we think, oh, come on but that we've still, because it's all this stuff that's been internalized into us since we were kids, that it's, it's a little harder to deprogram it all. Uh, so let's start at number one that uh, we pulled out here, which is let the man make the first move. Ooh. First of all, what is gender? Am I right? Yeah, no, for uh, sure. <laughs> so like Definitely. problem number one. Uh, okay. Do, do you two still find this, though, to be a thing? Because I feel like even if we say, like, yeah, whatever, I still feel like for myself and most people that I know, there still is an element of this at uh, play. That, like, women <sighs> feel weird about being the initiator and that men feel weird if they're not or feel like they have to. Like, even with people who you would think 
wouldn't be so concerned about this. I still, I still feel it. I'm aware that this is one that's still internalized in me. I am often the initiator and have been in like recent relationships. The one that I'm in now, I was definitely the initiator. So Mm -hmm. I don't know. To me, I'm like, eh. But it absolutely, I think a lot of people out there do believe like if you are a guy, then you should be the one doing the move making first. Uh, I don't know. I've seen this play out a number of different ways. I still think this is very much alive and well in our culture. First of all, being Mm -hmm. that I've mostly seen a surprising amount of men being uncomfortable when women make the first move. Again, I know heteronormative and like what is gender and all that stuff. But I know from my personal experience, I've definitely seen that of like some dudes just like really not knowing how to deal with it. You know, like it's that ingrained. Mostly Hmm. I've seen uh, what it seems to be like the leftover effect of this in uh, like literally I'm in a Facebook group that's for bisexual poly women who like don't know how to flirt with women because we've all been socialized that men are the ones who drive flirting. And I see that all the time. Yeah, I've heard that a lot. Yeah. Yes, all the time. And, And so... You know, I see that as just like a total natural result of us all thinking that like men are the ones who make the first move, Hmm. you know. And so then when if you're someone who has dated men and then are now trying to date women, then everyone's just like confused. And, you know, we just sit around staring at each other and no one makes a move. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I I also feel like the, the number one thing I wish that I could teach men when it comes to like approaching women or asking women out and stuff like that is that I want to say like, take a break for a few years and just date other men. Uh, Cause <laughs> it will open your eyes to this, to, to what that's like being on the receiving end of someone who feels like it's their job to kind of uh, force their courtship on you. Interesting. Um, and yeah. so it's, yeah, I wish, I wish that were like a training course that, that men could go through. Jace, if you can, Jace, if you can package it and market it and find a way there to sell it, if anyone could, it's you, Jace. Uh, there you well, go. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, all right, let's move on to the second one. All right, um, and that's the thing about the one it, that you'll find the one that they're out there. I don't know how much yeah. more we need to go into this one, but. <laughs> It's not necessarily our cup of tea, especially when people are divorcing after seven years and, you know, having two or three different spouses in their lifetimes or more. Yeah. It's like what I wish we could replace this with is that thing I was saying before about could we just replace it with it's possible to have a relationship where you are treated well and respected and you have 20 positive interactions to every one negative one that that's like teach them that that's possible instead of teaching them this idea of the one, because Mm. that's not helpful. Even if you did believe in soulmates and the one, if you don't have the tools or have those standards, you're not going to have a good relationship with them anyway. So it's like lose, lose, I guess. Yeah. What's another one? Uh, Next one I have here on the list is play hard to get. Yeah. So I still hear this all the time. Definitely. And whenever I do hear it, I, I just say to the person, like, why? Why do you want to do that? <laughs> Truly, like, what you know, if make your intentions known, in my opinion, just, you know, within reason, I suppose. But generally, it's like if you'd like someone and if you think that they like you back, like, just freaking talk to the person and, like, have an honest conversation with them. What is okay. so hard about yes. that? Yes, but I think that this idea of play hard to get has evolved and has morphed. Into what? Into be chill. <laughs> to be, okay. be no, chill. I, tell me what. Tell yeah. me. Tell me more. No, I'm serious. This is a huge thing. Like, I think this pressure that a lot of people put on themselves. I think most often it's women putting this pressure on themselves, but I think it goes across sure. the board. Of like when you're starting to get to know someone and you like them, it's like you got to be chill. You can't scare them off. Like uh, you can't expect to uh, rope in all their time. You got to like wait a couple hours before responding to their text. Don't respond to their text right away. Like this idea of be chill. It's, I I think it's a slightly different flavor from play hard to get, but I think with the same results or with the kind of the same pressure put on, put on the person. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's interesting about it though, is that when you were talking about that and I hear something like, don't expect to immediately monopolize all of someone's time. I'm like, yeah. 
That sounds good. That's something we say on this show. But when it's packaged in the like artificially do that or artificially wait to respond to a text or something, then I'm like, ooh, yeah, now that's now that's weird. And it's almost like, I don't know. On the one hand, I want to be like, yeah, fake it till you make it. But on the other hand, I want to be like, no, do the work for yourself so that that's honestly where you're coming from. So mm-hmm. that then the things that you do really express to them about your feelings can be genuine and not coming from a place of other programming that's taught you to be very you know needy or codependent or something. I don't know. Yeah, I feel I'm, like there's actually, a, we could do a whole episode probably on that one. Of on just hard be to chill. Get, of being chill. <laughs> or what is this? Yeah. What does this mean? Here's the title. Uh, Mul- be chill with multi-amory. What do you think? <laughs> I like it. Let's do it. Okay. Put it on the list. Be chill on well, Netflix but, with multi-amory. <laughs> yes. But, but there's this other layer to it of, and again, well, this will go into our full episode where we explore this whole thing, but there is this other layer of, you know, we're so used to there being just this harsh binary between either you're my soulmate and we're going to get married or you're just a casual hookup that like there's no space for any actual feelings Hmm. in there in the in-between you know and hence why it's like if i'm casually dating someone i cannot show any feeling whatsoever i think that's part of the whole be chill culture also like i cannot indicate that i like them i can't really compliment them i can't you know to like really give any tenderness or affection because they're going to think that i'm trying to rope them into marrying me or whatever and so i think that yeah. this whole play hard to get be chill thing is is part of that as well yeah. yeah yeah uh so let's keep rolling along so the next one is to never go to bed angry i definitely heard that one a lot i also heard kind of the joke version of it which is like don't go to bed angry stay up and fight uh which i <laughs> which also... is exactly like that's, that's, that's what, what that is. means yeah. that's what it is uh-huh. yeah because generally, um, I, to me, like you need to get away from the situation, and sometimes that means go to bed, wake up the next day, and you know have a clearer, calm mind about it. Now, it, it also is like the exact opposite of halt. It's yeah. like rather than stopping when you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, it's like no, you can't go to sleep. You got to power through this, which mm-hmm. isn't going to serve Stay anyone. Stay up forever. <laughs> I heard a a related piece of advice from in college. One of my girlfriends got this advice from her parents, which was never play backgammon with each other before going to bed (laughs) because for them, it led to them getting very competitive with each other. So it's almost like don't do stuff that could cause a fight right before bed. I'm like, okay, okay. All right. That's maybe a more constructive way. Having been only recently taught how to play backgammon. I would agree with that. (laughs) Don't do it. Don't play it. (laughs) Not before Before bed. bed. Yeah. Not before bed. Okay. Moving along to the next one. Opposites attract. Heard that a billion times. Mm -hmm. I I feel like I hear a lot of arguments for or against this. What do y'all think? I think it can, I mean, opposites can attract, but it definitely is nice when you have someone who has a lot of the same interests as you do. I mean, if you're completely just diametrically opposed about everything, I can't imagine what Kellyanne Conway and her husband have to deal with on a daily basis because they, one is a Trump staffer and the other freaking hates him. So well, what is that? Let's not conjure up the specter of that relationship. I'm just, Jeez, I'm Emily. Just like, what is happening there? What is going on? So... Well, I think that's that's an interesting thing, though, because I think it's possible to have different views on on even something like politics or mm-hmm. maybe even religion. I think that's a harder one, but it definitely happens, right, where people oh, have yeah. two different religions. I think it's possible. I think the problem with this one is the idea that you are opposites rather than it's OK to have different opinions from each other. Right. Like my grandparents one always voted Democrat, the other always voted Republican. And it was sort of their joke that like their votes amounted to nothing because they just canceled each other out all the time. And it's like, sure, that's true. And yet they actually did have a lot of similarities in their outlook and the way that they went about their lives and what was important to them and, you know, things like that. It, It almost makes this opposites attract thing makes me think about something we've talked about before about the idea that when people think like, oh, you know, we're opposites attract because my partner's an extrovert and I'm an introvert, that really it's just because from your point of view, they might seem like they're an extrovert, even though really in the grand scheme of things, you're both introverts or, yeah. or vice versa. You're both extroverts and you think one of you's actually an introvert because you're comparing to each other rather than to the whole world. So I, I think this one's mostly not true. Mm. 
I would agree that I do think opposites attract. Like, I think it's quite possibly to be attracted and, like, really drawn to someone who's very much the opposite with you and can seem like kind of some sexy, fun, wild adventure. Um, (laughs) I don't think that opposites necessarily attach well to Mm, each other. Like the opposite of magnets. Yeah. What's the opposite of a magnet? The opposite of a magnet. Uh, Tape. No, I, I have no, Wait, no idea. No, no, no. <laughs> I don't think no. that's what you were going for. <laughs> no. Well, you failed my SAT, Jace. I did. Oh. Yeah. What is so, so? Opposites are to magnets as op, as likenesses are to Velcro. Nope, that doesn't work either. No, Jace. To, oh, oh, I got it. Uh, that bondage tape that only sticks to itself. Oh. oh. Okay. Fine. Or, or like cling one. wrap or something. Yeah, I'll, I'll give, give you, you half points for that. Okay, <laughs> only half points. <laughs> I love it. Okay, um, moving along. Uh, this is a classic one. Uh, signs of jealousy means that they love you and care about you. Uh, we've talked about that a lot on this uh, on this podcast <laughs> over the years. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop in a controversial opinion because I think that feeling jealousy and feeling maybe an attachment crisis or feeling scared. You know, when your partner's flirting with someone else or maybe wanting to go on a date with someone else or maybe floating the idea of an open relationship with you or things like that. I think feeling that is an indicator that like, hey, the stakes are high for you Mm -hmm. and you do care. I think acting in a jealous way and acting on that jealousy is not a way to indicate love. That's my take. What do y'all think? Yeah, that's that's good. uh, No, I I like that. But yes, I think that if you do have intense jealousy generally it's not going to be an attractive thing for your partner in whatever fashion the two of you are choosing to live your lives whether it be monogamous or polyamorous or anything in between um because i have heard a lot of friends of mine a lot of people who've come up to me over the years say like you know i'm really in love with my girlfriend i'm really in love with my boyfriend or whomever uh but they are so jealous and it's really really hard to deal with that because I'm not going to do anything with them, but I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a like spicy, you know, have fun with my friends type guy and blah, blah, blah. And it's just very unattractive to have a jealous partner. So. Just, just the idea of being a spicy, have fun with my friends kind of guy. It's just a funny spicy, sentence. Spicy, fun with my friends kind of guy. Jace, Jace you to put that, that on your dating butt. profile now. Yeah, I'll just put that right up there. Yeah. I love it. Um, I was just going right. to say, it, it makes me think of the the uh, Clint Black song, the, the chorus is that um, love isn't someplace that we fall, it's something that we do. I almost feel like you could take that mm. idea and apply it to jealousy here, where like Dedeker said, feelings of jealousy could be a good indicator to yourself that this is important to you, mm-hmm. but doing jealousy is not a way of doing love. You know, that like the act, like acting jealous and doing the jealous things is not a way to love your partner and it's not a way to show doing them love. The jealous. Yeah. <laughs> don't doing do the, the jealous. Don't do no, the jealous. Don't you do that jealous. You can, you yeah. can quote us on that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, all right. So the next one is going to be that kids can fix a relationship. Mm. <sighs> this is another one where yeah. it's very easy to roll your eyes at. You know, and be like, surely everyone knows that kids don't fix a relationship until I was literally in a relationship with someone who thought that. Yep. Oh, really? Literally. <laughs> yes. I didn't know that you've dated people who have kids. No, not that they had kids, but like wanted to have kids. No, oh. really, I was in a relationship with someone and there were a lot of problems with this person and this relationship as it was. But like there was a time where I was expressing to him like wow, like there's a lot of pain and like a lot of hurt in our relationship and it feels hard to repair it. Like I just wish that there was something that we could do that could just like clear the slate and I wish that we could start over in some way and forgive each other, stuff like that. And he literally was like, we could have a kid. He was straight up like, that yeah, just like having completely a, having... negates everything that came before it. And I think when he said that, I did laugh out loud. I was like, oh, yeah, that's a good joke. That's good. And he was like, no, seriously. And you're like, like uh, having a baby uh, would probably help. Like it would help reset. And I was just like, you're like oh, it would but, not. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Literally, it, it blew my mind. Not. I wow. feel like we, we have some other versions of this that exist, too, which is moving in together mm-hmm. or or moving to a new place with each other. That I think those two kind of fall into this similar category of 
there's a problem and our idea for fixing it is to get ourselves into more of a situation that makes it harder to actually address the problem because we're adding some other stress on top of it. Uh, it but it's, it's very prevalent that, that thing of like, or, it's difficult, but uh, it'll probably be easier if we live together or getting married or opening up your relationship or adding a third or any number of dramatic any, things. I would say but, any big yeah. change, any really. outside thing. Yeah. yeah. It's like, uh, that's just uh, remember everyone out there just, <laughs> Changing your relationship in a dramatic way does not necessarily mean that it's going to fix it. Yeah. Whether it be a kid or whatever else. So, okay, this one I I was laughing at because it came from The Rules, the book that we will be talking about a little bit later on the uh, bonus episode for all of you patrons out there. But in The Rules, it said that to do no more than casual kissing on the first date and no casual sex if you really like someone. So I don't Emily, know what casual you... kissing is. <laughs> I was going to say, can you, what would it's be like, your best guess like of a what side casual kiss? kissing is? Like a side hug? Like the yeah, side exactly. hug version of a kiss? It's like a one armed hug. Exactly. It's like a one armed <laughs> kiss, however you, uh, whatever that means to you. A casual kiss. Maybe that's kiss. Like, like the European style kissing, you know. Oh, maybe no tongue. Like, no tongue. Oh, yeah. Maybe they mean no oh, tongue. Or what if it's kissing but not holding hands? That that's a casual kiss. There you go. Oh, yeah. yeah you yeah. can't do both. No other part of your body can touch, just the mouth. You cannot be embracing. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Anyways, yeah. Uh, yes, we're all laughing at this. But yeah, no casual sex, I guess, until later if you really like someone. The thing and again, what is a ca- – I mean, well, casual yeah. sex is casual sex, whatever. But yeah, the, that's – it's an interesting modifier. It's funny, though, because I could see you posing the same question about sex of like what makes a kiss casual and what makes sex casual. Mm-hmm. I think that's an interesting thing to think about. The thing I want to bring up about the sex one or the kissing, I guess, but I feel like it, in my life it's come up more around sex that I've heard people say like, oh, well, I actually like this person, so I'm going to wait yeah. a little while to have sex with them. And it's like, Why? Well, there's this, Go for it. there's this tough thing because most, like statistically speaking, most new relationships or people that you date probably aren't going to work out. You know, just, just statistically, like you're going to date a few people before you find a relationship that lasts a while, however mm-hmm. long that is. And so it's very easy for someone to then in retrospect blame themselves for having done this thing too early, right? For having had sex too early. That it's like a really easy one to find confirmation for, like, and to have your confirmation bias show that to you. But what I've found, you know, trying to be aware of that and really thinking about that and looking back at, at all my relationships, I've had some where we have had sex on the first date and some where we've waited, you know, where we've known each other for several months or even years before having sex. And when I actually look at it, I'm like, there's not a correlation between which no. ones turned into long-term loving relationships that even lasted after the romantic relationship ended versus ones that didn't like, there's not a correlation there. It doesn't have to do with sex or not. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. From, from my experience at least. Yeah. Yeah. So with all of this, we kind of just want to remind everyone that, you know, rules to relationships do not necessarily apply to you. Um, They may or they may not. And so it's really very valuable to kind of take relationship advice with a grain of salt wherever it comes from and whomever it comes from, even from us, just because people's personal biases are going to be attached to it. So, you know, you kind of need any relationship advice that you're getting to be tailored and designed to you and to the type of relationship that you're in. So that's kind of one of the reasons why we on this podcast throw a lot of things at you all out there, because we also are just sort of picking and choosing the things that we like and choosing to give it to you or choosing to use it and implement it in our own relationships. So we hope that you all do that out there as well, even with some of this old antiquated relationship advice. If it works for you, great. If it doesn't, then yeah, take some other advice. Yeah, uh, but with all of that, like, still remember uh, our our main rules, which is don't sign anything in the first year. Yes, and it's okay to break up. You're not a bad person. 
Absolutely. All right. So we're excited to go on to record our bonus episode for our patrons. And in that, we're going to be talking about some of the wackiest advice from the book of the rules. So if you want a a good laugh um, or maybe a view into the the tragedy that is relationship advice in the mainstream, uh, (laughs) stick around or become a patron for that. We would love to hear your thoughts. Were any of these things that you've struggled with or that you realize, oh gosh, I still have some of that in me. Uh, We would love to hear from you and other listeners would love to discuss with you. And the best place to do that is in this episode's discussion thread in our private Facebook group or Discord chat. You can get access to these groups and join our exclusive community by going to patreon.com slash multiamory. In addition, you can share with us publicly on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can email us at info at multiamory.com or send us a message on Facebook. Multiamory is created and produced by Dedeker Winston, Emily Matlack, and me, Jace Lindgren. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio Balvanera. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our production assistants are Rachel Shenowark and Carson Collins. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. Hi, I'm Cam Poder. And I'm Karen Lee Poder. And we host the Sex Talk with My Mom podcast. We are excited to answer the Pleasure Podcast's question of the month. What is our number one sex tip for quarantine? Mom, what's yours? I like the idea of Zoom sex with other people. What? What are you making a face for? Have you done that? As a matter of fact, yes, I have. No, you have not. Yes, I have. And you I'm have not gonna... Zoom sex? Yes. With who? We're not going to get into this right now. There's only 30 second clip. Oh my God. Do you want to hear more from my mother about her sex life? Do you want to hear more from my son about his sex life or lack thereof? Thank you. Check out the Sex Talk with My Mom podcast. <laughs>